Amen. That's right. My life is all about Jesus. That's what I know. Hi, Facebook guys and YouTube guys. Today we're gonna we're, we're in the Friend of Sinners Part Three, and uh, I titled this one "The Shepherd and Overseer of Our Souls." And so, so let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for this time. You know, we get to spend not only together but in your Word, Lord. In, in, in uh, the, we, we live in a country that we, we can still do this, Lord. And I pray that you protect us as we do this, Lord, and, and that you keep us safe, and that we can continue to do so. Because in other countries, you know, they have to hide to do what we're doing today to have church, Lord. So thank you for the privilege and honor of getting to gather together in the name of Jesus, your Son. Lord, and we ask that today your Holy Spirit come take over, that I decrease and that you increase, and that I can, that you fill me with your Spirit, that I can teach and preach under the anointing of your Holy Spirit, and that these words would be brought alive because they're from the Word of God, those teachings from the Word of God. So Lord, come open our minds and open our hearts and prepare our hearts with good soil, that the seeds of your Word can get planted in our lives and produce the maximum amount of fruit they're capable of doing. And we pray all this for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. And we all say, Amen. 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 Okay. Now the Bible, the Bible talks a lot about God's people being sheep. Okay. Now if you study sheep, I don't know if that's really a compliment. <laughs> you know, because sheep really aren't that... Well, anyways, there's an old story about a farmer who was brought to the hospital because his wife thought he had a stroke. You know, he was in the sun all day, and, and whether it was a stroke or a heat stroke... They brought him in, and, and they were, they were try, tr trying to attempt what had gone on, to assess what had gone on, his mental state. So the, the doctor asked him, if you have 100 sheep in the pasture and seven escape, how many will you have left? And he, he, he looked at him, and he shook his head, he goes, you won't have any sheep. He goes, oh, no, that's not the right answer. The right answer. You don't have 93 sheep. He said, doctor, you don't know nothing about sheep. Them critters, they ain't. <laughs> You lose one sheep, you're going to lose them all. <laughs> so, so, sheep, 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 if you study sheep, you find that they're not very smart. Okay? Some people say they're witless. Yeah, I've never heard anybody say, I went out and bought an attack sheep. You know, I, want to, I, want to, I bought a sheep to guard the house. No. Yeah. You know, they're powerless animals. You know, they, they're not. You know, they're, they're herd animals. And, and, and listen, the coyotes, wolves, dogs terrorize. It, they're they're afraid of pigs. You know, they, they, <laughs> the pig is freaking or herd of sheep out. Okay, listen, you, you have to, you know, you've heard, I've heard internet accounts of, of dogs that you know one dog one dog slaughtered thirty one sheep. Then there's two pet dogs that the sheep came by the house so the dogs got out and they killed like sixteen of them. You know, listen. There was a, this guy who came, used to come to church. He grew up, he grew up with a sheep, and he told, he told a story about one time his pet dog was nibbling, you know, started chewing on the ear, and the sheep just let him until finally he had like, chewed his, chewed, chewed, chewed his ear all the way down his head. The sheep, they're dumb. They're like, duh, he's chewing on my ear. <laughs> I mean, you know, listen, sheep may be dumb, but the Bible says that they're valuable. See, King David says that, you know, that he says the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, he's saying he's a sheep. You know, that, that, I mean, listen, traders, you know, if, if, if you look at sheep, you know, they, they're valued for clothing. Their wool is worth a lot of money. Okay? Listen, I don't know why, you know, I, I don't really, I don't, you know, they, they were very precious to the Israelites for offerings. Okay, today in most countries, I don't know, in some some places in America make mutton, but most of, most places around the world they make mutton. Mutton comes from a three year old sheep. The sheep has to be at least three years old to make mutton. There's a delicacy prized all over the world called lamb chops, and that's to be a yearling or a little younger. That's a young sheep. The young as a young lamb. I mean, listen, it's valuable. Lamb, lamb's milk costs three to four times what a gallon of milk costs. Okay, if you buy it, I don't think you can even buy it by the gallon. I think you buy it by the quart. Okay, listen. Uh, the, the, today, people have been known to clone them. 
You know, they raise them like children. They even they even keep, keep them in their yard to mow the grass. <laughs> you know, they buy sheep and goats because they don't have to mow the grass. You know, they move them from pasture. If you have a lot of land, you move them from pasture to pasture, and you don't have to worry about it. They, you know, they take care of it for you. And, but in Luke 15, Jesus, Jesus, it's funny because he, he's accused of eating with sinners, and he defends he defends his association with sinners and tax collector, and prepares sinners to lost sheep. So listen, that that, that makes my ears perk up because I, I like I, I really take seriously what Jesus says. You know, it took me a long time in my life to do it, but now now that I'm older, <laughs> them words written in red. Pay attention. The Lord compares men to sheep. He calls himself the great shepherd and the overseer of our souls. See, even Pastor Ray has an overseer. <laughs> Anybody listening today? We got a child. He made him overseer. God. If they, if, they, if they have a title like that, God probably gave it to him. So be careful. Listen. How has God demonstrated His love for us? What would he do for his love for us? How does he, why does he do the things he does for us? <clears throat> because he loved, he already proved he loved us. While we were still and yet sinners, he paid the ultimate price. But if he paid the ultimate price, he's still good. Listen, he, he'll still, he still goes, he still, let's read the story. Okay, in Luke chapter 15, turn to your Bibles in Luke chapter 15. I love this chapter because three different there's three different parables. We're going to stick with the one. We're going to stick with the first. But there's three different parables in Luke 15 that talk about people losing something. Okay. But my first point, my, the first point I'm going to point is the great shepherd. Look, he knows it. He he knows and locates every sheep of the flock. He knows when one goes missing. I don't know about you, but when he left the 99 to go find the lost one, I was one of them. <laughs> and I remember that. Because I can look back at my life and I wasn't so smart either. <laughs> I needed to be hurt to death. Out there doing drugs, you know, getting locked up, and doing a, killing myself. But Jesus loved me. Let's read. Let's read the ch chapter 15, verse 1 says, All the tax collectors and sinners, I love that. All the all the, the rebels tax all the tax all the tax collectors and re rebellious people of the day. Okay, that, that's for me. We're approaching Jesus to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. The Jewish people weren't supposed to do that back then. Verse three. So he told them this parable. What man among you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them? Does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it. Amen. Listen, what does that tell you? God cares for every sheep. God cares for every one of his sheep. For God so loved the world. He didn't just love us. He, for God so loved the cosmos where he put mankind. Okay? Listen, the, the 99 sheep that are, that are still unharmed and in the sheepfold, he notices one's missing. He values healthy sheep. He values docile sheep. He values the household sheep. He even values black sheep. But I want to tell you, he values lost sheep. He values inferior sheep. He values disabled sheep. He values rebellious sheep. He values all sheep. Okay. He identifies each one of them. Listen, he searches for them one by one. Until he finds them. Until he finds them. He he counts them and he pictures. Listen, he knows what we. He knows us. God knows us. He, you gotta remember, Jesus is God, God the Son. He know he's omniscient. He never lost being part of God when he was a man. 
But he became a man for us so he could do what he did for us and die for us on the cross. And today he's still a man that sits in heaven at God's right hand. And he's still God. And see, all three God, the God, there's only one God, and they all work together in perfect harmony. There's no, they're, they're always unified. That's why he wants us to unity with us. Because there's always unity with God. That's in John chapter 17. He said, I pray, Lord, that they may be one as we are one. Anybody listening today? Yeah. We're all part, I'm part of you. You're part of me. We're part of each other. And you got to learn that now. That way, if you go somewhere else, well, you're still part of us. Because you're part of the church. doesn't matter what church you go to. Like I said, I, I, it's so funny, man. In First Corinthians three, Paul rebuked them. Oh, I go to set free. I, I go to set free. You abandon. I go to set free. You know, you go to, you go to, you're part of the church. It doesn't matter whether you go to the Way, the Rock. It doesn't matter whether you go to a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church. It don't matter if you go to set free or any other church. You're part of the church, and by the way, it all belongs to Jesus. He rebuked them and said, "You guys, I want to feed you meat, but you guys are babies. But you're still acting that way." <coughs> We gotta remember we're part of something that's way bigger than us. It's way bigger than set free. It's way it's it's we're part of the church, and the church is pretty big. We gotta quit thinking that way. Amen. Listen, he he doesn't care. He he in, in his mind he wants to safeguard them, so he has to go find them. Okay. He doesn't care if you're young or old. He doesn't care if you're a ram or a you, in other words, a male or a female. He doesn't care if you're present or missing. He doesn't care, you know, if, you know, if, you know, if you're wearing a disguise. <laughs> you know, he doesn't care what shape you are, if you're skinny or fat. He don't, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't care about your likes and your dislikes. He doesn't care about, you know, he cares about your, your behavior and your habits, but, you know, he, if something happens to you, no matter what condition you're in, he goes, comes to search for you. Amen. And he always will. And he always will. Amen? Who's in guilt? Please. Like I said, in Luke 15, there's three, three different stories. And the first, the first story is the parable of the sheep. You know, the, the, the percentage of the shepherd's loss is really low compared to the, to the other two stories. Okay? And there's only one out of 99. You know? But if you, you go to the parable of the coin, there's 10 coins and she only loses one. But wait a minute. You get to the parable of the prodigal son, and there's two sons, and he loses one. See, so that listen it doesn't matter it doesn't matter any doesn't matter what the percentage is if something is lost God cares okay the, 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 it's, between the sheep the good shepherd is already written there's no sheep that the good shepherd is ready to part with and by the way he does not assume the worst and he does not give you up for lost he will always search for you. I know because he did me. Amen? Every loss is irreplaceable. Every loss is senseless and every loss is unacceptable. Period. Okay? Hired hands will cry wolf. In other words, people in the church, the hired hand, I think that's us in the church. We want to think, oh, that guy cried wolf. You know, I think that's us. And we, you know, the people come to the church and they went, you know, go back and they, they backslide or they get high again or they get drunk. And, yeah, I knew he was going to do that. Shut up, shut up. We're, supposed, we're, we're here to restore them. We're not here to, to judge them or to say, oh, yeah, he did it again. You know, most, most of us are probably, how many chances have we gotten? But, man, I've gotten way, but I've I gotten so many chances, I can't even count them. God, they said, oh, God, God will have a second chance. No, he's not. He's a God of another chance. Yeah. However many you need, he'll give you as long as you're willing to come back yeah. and, and say you're sorry and be willing to change. So, they're, they're, most of us are willing to change. We just don't know how. Let me tell you, give your life to Jesus. Start living for Jesus. 
period. Start doing what you're told. You know, it's our obedience that proves our love for the Lord. He said, if you love me, obey me. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Those who obey me are them that love me. Amen. That's in John, John chapter 14 through 17. Okay. Listen. The great shepherd patiently and instinctively tirelessly pursues lost sheep. There's no employee, no dog or pig that can take his place. No, there, nothing can match his love for us. I know from experience. There's, got, there's a quote, somebody once quoted, God does not love me because I am good. He loves me because I am precious, and I am precious because Christ died for me. You listening? Which brings me to my, name, my next point, the great shepherd leads every sheep to the fold. What does that mean, Pat? Back to church. That's why it's so important to come to church. So many people today, and I know the pandemic scares people, did, but there's no replacement for fellowship. Get the gathering, the, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Why? To encourage one another as you see the day drawing near. Whoa, man, what day is that? The day of Christ's return. Listen, wars and rumors of wars, man. I mean, we're watching biblical prophecy come to life. Russia's moving. Now they're threatening Jerusalem. They're threatening Israel. I mean, that's Gog and Magog from uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. We're watching it start to begin. But God's going to protect Israel. We don't have to worry about that. But when Jesus said, when you see these things happen, be prepared and look up because your redemption is drawing near. So we need to be ready. Physically, spiritually. Okay. You go to Luke chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. It says, when he found the lost sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together and he says to them, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. Listen, our daily bread, it tells account of a sociologist who was writing about the difficulties of growing up in a large family. He interviewed a mother of 13 children, and he mentioned several general questions and asked the questions deliberately. And these are the, some of the questions. Do you think all children deserve full, impartial love and the attention of their mother? The mother said, of course. It's okay. So he also asked another question. He says, well, which of your 13 children do you love the most? She, she thought to herself for a minute, she goes, well, the one who's sick until he gets well, and the one who's away until he gets home. Think about that. Healthy people don't need physicians. If we're doing good, God, praise God, we're doing good, but when we're not doing so good, that's when the Lord starts to worry about us. And don't you think that he don't worry about you, because he loves you. Amen. In my mental image of the Good Shepherd previously, it was formed by a lot of different pictures that I saw when I was a kid. Okay, especially raised in the Catholic Church. Here you go by. Jesus was always holding a little lamb. Uh -uh. That's a wrong picture. See, a little lamb can weigh 40, 50, 60 pounds. Whole full grown sheep weigh 130 to 150 pounds. <laughs> That he is a, that, that, that's what that's what he carried. That's what the shepherd carried on. It wasn't a lost lamb. It was a lost sheep. And when he went and found it, he put it on his shoulders and carried it home. Listen to the scripture. But, but he, when, he, he, when he found it, he joyfully put it on his shoulders. And coming home, he called his friends and neighbors, saying to them, he put it on. He carried a 150 pound sheep home. That's like that's like that's like you carrying your brother. That's like you going out and finding somebody wounded, a soldier. Some of you, some of you guys don't weigh much. Some of you guys weigh more than two hundred pounds. Some of you guys don't weigh much. You know, but some of you, one of you don't weigh even weigh one hundred fifty pounds. You know what I mean? Listen, that, 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 what, what kind of effort does it take to carry one hundred fifty pound sheep? That's some, that's some work. And besides that, that old sheep don't smell good. He's full of lanolin. He's full of dirt. He smells pretty right. So not only do you carry that, you get the full smell that goes along with it. Even when you take the sheep off, you still smell like that. 
It's the way it is. That's like hugging these street people. It's your, it's, it's, you hug people here all day, you go home and take a bath. And, throw, and the first thing you do is throw my shirt in the washer. But that's what love is. Love goes the extra mile. Listen. Furthermore, there's no time, no time did the shepherd ever leave the sheep. He didn't stop to rest and he didn't delay the journey. He went and searched for the sheep till he found it and he brought it right home. There's no lag time with God. There's no lag time with God. Jesus Christ, the shepherd and overseer of our souls, will climb the steepest mountain. He'll comb the tallest grass. He'll cover the farthest and widest, most outermost area for a lost soul. He not only has the biggest heart, the fondest affection, and the kindest compassion for the lost sinner, but he also has the broadest shoulders to lean upon. Amen? And to carry us with. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I think maybe that's why he said it. See, he had a relationship with the Lord. He knew the Lord. He loved the Lord. Because he loved the Lord, he was fearless. Remember, he said, I, I killed a wolf and I killed a bear one time. Because the Lord was with me. And when he fought Goliath, he said, you're not coming against me. You're coming against the armies of the Lord of hosts. He knew the God that he served. Do you know the God you serve? Do you know that he loves you? Yes, he's almighty God. Has such a big heart for you and me. And also these people that smell like they go in the street. He loves us. Listen, the Lord can lift up. He can bear or haul any individual of any size. Okay? He, it doesn't matter what their condition or shape. You know, he's never tired of tending sheep. He's never, you know, you know, he's never tired of guarding the sheep. He will never stop caring for the sheep. If a, if a lost sinner can rest comfortably and travel peacefully, then he can return safely home. Amen. The great shepherd takes the responsibility of guarding all our sheep. We need to remember that. That's why a lot of these street people are still there. Because the Lord has a, you know, we just got to keep loving them. And keep telling them about Jesus. Keep telling them, yeah, I used to be like you, but you can change. You can give your life to Jesus. So, so the, great shepherd, my, my, the great shepherd loves every sheep in the field. He mean, man, okay, for chapter 15, verses 6 and 7. Remember, he puts it on shore as he comes home. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need to. Amen. Listen. Listen, what, what, what's, what, what's he trying to tell you? There's three kinds of joy. He's trying to tell us there's three kinds of joy. Okay, the first kind of joy... In Jesus' teaching, in John 15, 11, he says, I have spoken these things to you that so, you, that so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Okay, that, that's the joy of someone who's born again. Okay, that's the joy of someone who's born again. That we, we learn what the joy of the Lord is. Man, because it's not, it's not we're not happy. We're happy. We're happy because, oh, look at all the food we got. You know, look, I got this stuff. I got some money. You know, I'm happy. You know, but things get rough and you go, oh, man, I'm so, I'm not so happy no more, are you? But wait a minute. Even in that, even in the tough times, I can have that joy in my heart because I know you're love. I know you love me. I know you're still with me. Even though time, times are tough, you know, you, even though I, you know, God, God didn't just take Israel and put them over the sea. He parted the Red Sea so they had to go through the trouble. Yeah, that's my joy because I know no matter what I face, no matter what trouble I have to go through, the Lord's gonna, He's gonna get me through it. And that's that joy. That's 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 the joy of a saved person that's born again, that knows Jesus. God, God, you ain't God, you haven't failed me yet. I know you're not gonna fail me this time. That's the first kind of joy. Amen. The second kind of joy is heavenly joy. Okay, Luke 6 23 says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note that your reward is in heaven. See, that, that's, that's the, you know, listen, when, you, listen, when, when, you, when you're saved and you know, and then people, bad things start to happen, people start talking about you. Oh, that guy, oh, he got saved. He got, he got religion. You know, I mean, you, you hear all kinds of stuff. 
A lot of my friends did it to me, you know. Oh, you, oh, you turned into a Jesus freak. You know? I sure did. This is, so, so don't rejoice. In, in Luke 10, 20, you know, he, sent, he sent out 70 guys two by two, and they came back. They said, man, even the demons are subject to you. And then he said, don't rejoice over that. He said, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen? Amen? Amen. See that done. But, but the last kind of joy, the, the joy that Jesus is talking about in Luke chapter 15 here, is, listen, this is angelic joy. This, this is a party in heaven. I think it's not just a party in heaven, but for the people, for the for the people who have passed on and they're there, you know, it's just to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. You know, I don't, so I, I think you know, so we we get to, but wait a minute, we get to partake of that too. When one sinner repents, we know that Jesus told us there's a party in heaven, so we can party here too. Joy. I can man, praise God. I've been praying for this guy. There's a story I love, I love Seth for you because. That there's, there's a guy, his name was Pastor Jack, and he used to tell a story about his dad was a rodeo rider. He rode in the rodeo for 50 years. And he was a drill, you know, being a rodeo rider, he'd get drunk and he'd tear it up, you know, yee haw, you know. And, and, and his mom prayed for him for more than 50 years. And finally, when he was 80 years old, he gave his life to Christ. And there was a party. And, but it took. His wife prayed for him for 50 years before he gave his life to Jesus. Are you willing to pray for somebody that long? <laughs> you never know when. You never know when. Nobody comes to the Son unless the Father draws him. That's right out of Scripture. Okay? So listen. Angelic joy. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Wow. I tell you, uh, uh, verse 10 says, I tell you in, in the same way there will be more joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. That's from the parable of the lost coins. Listen, the, the popular reasons to rejoice in the Old Testament, they, they rejoiced in the bounty of the Lord. In other words, when they had a good harvest or when they got paid well or when, you know, it's when the Lord really blessed Israel. You're supposed to rejoice over when God blesses you, you're supposed to rejoice. Okay, like when we get food, you know, we got it. But we empty the freezers and now it's sort of full again. Rejoice. You know what I mean? You're supposed to rejoice. That's Jeremiah 31 12. Okay, we're supposed to rejoice over the bounty of the harvest. Like when you grow, when, when things grow good well, that's Isaiah 9 3. We're, we're supposed to uh, 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 rejoice over the bounty of God's gifts. That's Deuteronomy 26 11. What are his gifts? Listen. Listen, when somebody is saved, that's a gift. You know, when you minister to somebody, when you help them, that's a gift. When you use your spiritual gifts, that's God's gifts. Amen? Listen, for the works of our hands. We're supposed to rejoice over the works of our hands. That's Psalm 104, 31. Well, a lot of times, listen, when you guys clean up, rejoice. Look around and rejoice and take pride. No, I'm not saying be proud, but I'm just, you know, rejoice over the work of your hands. It takes a lot of work to keep this church clean and going. I mean, when you clean the toilets, do it for the Lord. Clean that toilet for Jesus, man. I'm telling you, if you clean that toilet for Jesus, somebody's going to go in there and turn the light on. They're going to be, wow, that's right. It's clean, man. Yeah. Wow. That's because you did it for Jesus. Amen? Okay? Rejoice over the wonder of life. Rejoice over the wonder of nature and creation. How about rejoicing over, over the insurance of deliverance? That's Psalm 9, verse 14. You're supposed to rejoice over love. That's Psalm 31, 7. Not only only over God's love, but you guys, I'm so proud of you guys in the house. You guys are a family in that house. You guys are brothers. And brothers love, yeah, brothers fight. But brothers really do love each other. Yeah. You, know, you guys might fight together, but somebody else challenges you. Hey, don't you mess with my brother. You know, my brother could kick my butt, but when somebody else tried to kick my butt, say, hey, leave him alone. Amen? Amen? Listen, we're supposed to rejoice over God's promises. Psalm 119, 162. That's why we read his words. Every time you read his words, ask, is, is there a promise for me to keep? Is there a promise for me to believe? Okay? Is there something for me to apply? Is there something I need to change? 
that every time you read God's word, you should be asking yourself those questions. Amen? This is, Jesus discloses the whole reason for joy. The repentance of a lost sinner. Man, for friend, people that live heaven and earth, God's angels, you know, the, the celebration of repentance, the conversion and salvation of a soul, the, the, the convert is now a brand new creation in Christ. Okay? And he's also a new person, a new man, or a new self. But he's also, if we lead him to the Lord, it's our responsibility to disciple him. Hello? The evangelical church in America, we go, we go, we go and get decisions for Christ. Jesus didn't, he didn't say go into all the world and get decisions for Christ. He said go, go into all the world and make disciples. In other words, if we get them to make a decision, yeah, I believe. That's why it's so important to get, to get them to the ranch. Because that's where the discipleship process begins. That's why we're so, we're so that's why we're doing the evangelism explosion course. That's why we're, you know, you're learning Romans Road. That's why you do it. We're, you guys are, if, if you're not learning about Jesus here, you're in the wrong place. This is all about G, man. This, we're learning how to share the gospel. Learning how to share the word. Letting, to learn how to let your salt be salty and your light be really bright. I don't, I don't need no twinkle, twinkle spotlights here. I, I, need, I need some big, brilliant spotlights. You know? Listen. The, the, the only biblical, this is the only biblical patch, passage that we, God rejoices with man. We get to, this is the thickest man. Man, when, we, when we're fishing for people, remember I told you, if Jesus said, follow me, I'll teach you how to fit, I'll make you fishers of men. If we're not fishing for men, who are we following? That's one of the first things he told his disciples. Okay? Listen. Man joins in God's celebration, not man rejoicing by or in for himself. We're rejoicing with the Lord. We're rejoicing with the angels. We're rejoicing with the great cloud of witnesses that are gone before us, that are waiting for us. Okay, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, true gold cannot be replaced. True gold cannot replace the, the prodigal son's turnaround. True gold cannot replace the prodigal son's turnaround. The prodigal son's turnaround, the prodigal son coming home is more valuable than anything. A sinner getting saved is more valuable than gold. Human or worldly happiness does not last the, the, no celebration is like the celebration of the angels in heaven, okay, before God's presence. No joy is greater in heaven or on earth than the joy of seeing unsaved people getting saved. Not even, not even beholding the greatest wonders in the world, the Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, the Egyptian pyramids. You could go see them and go, wow, man, take pictures. But the greatest joy you'll have is when you lead someone to Christ. Trust me, if you have a man, I'm, you know, Jesus came across some very intolerant people who saw no possibility for these despised people to be saved. How can you eat with tax collectors and sinners? I'm so glad he does because I'm a stinking sinner. I don't know about you. I collected a few taxes too, but that's an old different story. Listen. Listen, it was the despised sinner. It was the, it was the lost people that listened to Jesus. Wow, Steve, no one ever spoke like this to you. Amen. Listen, God can save lost souls. Everyone has the chance to repent, and the greatest joy of heaven is the earthly homecoming of a lost sinner. Okay. So let me, 1 Peter Chapter 1, verse 20 says, so says, You were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's the scripture I got the title of the sermon from. Amen. But have you really returned? Is there still something in your life that you know? Maybe some of us need to stop smoking. Maybe the Lord's been working in that. Oh, I can quit anytime, Pastor Ray. I've quit hundreds of times. That's my point, exactly. You know, they pulled, they had to pull it too, so I'd leave my cigar, I'd leave smoking alone for a couple of days. And I, I'm okay, I don't need to eat one. 
I'm already delivered. I just have to walk into deliverance. Jesus purchased me. It's just tobacco. Half of you guys, when you went to the ranch, oh, I didn't smoke at the ranch. Right, no, no, smoking's not going to send you to hell, but it might send you to heaven sooner than you want to get there. <laughs> Both of my parents died of lung cancer, so I, I think about it every time I smoke sometimes. I get to grab a jar of cigar, and I'm like, my parents died of lung cancer, what am I doing smoking? I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm stupid. I don't want to be stupid no more. I don't want to do that. Anything that doesn't glorify God, I don't think I want to do anymore. I'm, I'm longing for heaven, but I don't want to get there sooner than I'm supposed to go. <laughs> Hello, anybody listening? So we, we need to start reaching out. You know, remember that these people are the people around us. You know, maybe you know, are you in a backslidden condition? People say, "Oh no, I'm not so good." Listen, are you still thinking about your old life? Are you more are you more focused up on you? Then you are the Lord, then you're in a backslidden condition. Your mind should be totally fixed. Fix your mind. Your, your mind should be fixed on heavenly things. Your mind should be full of the Word of God. If you're thinking about what you want to do or what you shouldn't do, you're not thinking about what God, what God wants you to do, and you're not doing what God wants you to do. It's where, where's your mind? Where the mind goes, the man follows. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I gotta go do this, I gotta do that, I gotta get a job, I gotta do this. Backsliding. The Lord wants to, it says in Jeremiah, the Lord can heal you of that if you let him. He loves healing the backslider. So we have to be honest about where we're at. Amen? Get your mind fixed on it. Fix your, but the Bible says, fix, fix your eyes on Jesus. Well, fix your eyes on, what does that mean? That, well, listen to it. You take a nail and you put it in the wall and you fix the picture on the wall. And if you fix it well, the picture stays there really well. If you don't fix it well, the picture falls off. Is that, is that what's happening to you? You're supposed to fix your eyes on Jesus, but you can't, you can't keep your eyes on him. Your eyes keep falling away from him. Your eyes aren't fixed on Jesus. If you fix a picture on the wall, it stays on the wall. It don't fall off. I mean, if you... Oh, I, fix, I put the picture on the wall, and then everybody, everybody comes to your house, and all of a sudden the picture goes, <coughs> you didn't fix it on the wall, but you did, you know. But we keep doing, that's what we do when we take our eyes off the Lord. That's in Hebrews chapter 12, fix your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's an old hymn. Amen. So today, let's bow our hearts before Jesus. Let me ask you, where are you? Have you wandered from God? Are, are your eyes fixed on Jesus? Or are, you, are your eyes fixed on something for you in this world? Then you need to fix them back on Jesus. Listen, God, will, God, God loves you. He knows what you need more than you want. He knows what you need more than you do. Trust him and wait upon him. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Okay. Do you know that Jesus loves you more than anything? Do you know he loves you so much he died for you? Maybe, maybe your thought life needs some, some cleansing. But, but put, put some water through the grounds again. <laughs> but put, keep, put, 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 you put the water of the word through your, through your mind. Keep, keep washing your mind with the water of the word. And you'll get clarity. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In other words, quit thinking so much. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. In other words, in everything that you do, make sure He's the, the major part of it. And, and, and He'll direct you back. He'll take you where He wants you to go. Don't, don't settle for a job that you want. Wait for the job that God wants for you. Don't settle for the person. Don't settle for that relationship that you want. You wait on the relationship God wants for you. I live it every day. I love my wife so much. I know my wife loves me and we're so blessed. And God takes care of us. I'm not rich, but I'm not poor. Wait on the Lord and trust in Him and He'll bring it to pass. And it all starts when you let Jesus in. And how do you let Jesus in? You, you just ask Him to come in. But you got to be willing to change. That's what repentance is. It's your willingness to change. 
You won't know how to change it first. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna struggle because, but, but the more you believe in Jesus, the more you really believe in Jesus, the more you will change. That the change of your life, the repentance and change of your life, is proof that you believe in the one who loves you the most, Jesus Christ. Because His Holy Spirit's gonna come in. And he's going to start convicting and convincing you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And little by little, your whole, your, your whole life is going to change. First, it's the big things that everybody else can see. And then it'll be the little things that no one sees. All the prejudices, all the stuff that you were, like, you know, all the little stuff you learned on the street and then from, your, from the gangs and, and on the, the stuff the devil taught you while you were in the world doing what you were doing. And you will change. Trust me. So if you want to change, if you really want that, then just repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to pay the price for my sin. I am a sinner. And I admit it. And I admit that I need to change. Jesus, you died for me on the cross. You shed your blood so I could be forgiven. You rose from the grave on the third day to give me eternal life. Today I want it. Come into my heart, Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and seal me for the day of redemption. And from this day forward, help me to go your way, not mine. Help me to glorify you, not me. Help me to read the Bible and do what it says, even when I don't understand it. And from this day forward, make me into that new creation that you want me to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks you for worshiping with us. If you need prayer, if I hang out with you, if you had, if you want, to, if you need a blessing, hang out. Who?